it's a huge, huge, huge EDM event, I would call it, at the moment. Um, numbers about 170,000 people over three days. And uh, interestingly for me, the crowd was completely Indian people. It wasn't Western backpackers. It wasn't Israeli side trance people. It was all Indian people. And uh, it's a massive, massive event. And uh, Sunburn also organized 200 plus parties around India. So India as a market, Sunburn is central in developing that. Um, next up, we have Craig Pettigrew. Craig is from BPM Festival in Mexico, another event that has just exploded in the last few years and had incredible um, attention worldwide and incredible lineups, very much focused on the kind of underground house, tech house world, um, no EDM at all, I would, from what I can see, um, but we'll touch, we'll touch on that. And last but not least, we have from Portugal, we have Gustavo Pereira, um, from the somewhat strangely named to me, Neopop Festival, um, 10 years running. This year, headliners are Richie Horton, uh, Martinez Brothers, and I can't remember the third one. Sven Vat, yeah. Not only the headliner. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to, so huge range of people with different areas, different areas of genre. I'm going to start with you. You know, we emailed a bit before, we gave me some stuff about the state of the market. Um, you were called originally anti-pop. Yeah, exactly. So what made the switch from anti-pop to new to? Um, was actually the name was initially was that the idea was to do something that was against, like not against, but um, more underground. You know, not um, pop music or not inside. Like I think nowadays electronic music is getting pop. You know, like somehow. You know, and. Like our idea was not going to the same direction that everyone was going, you know, and we wanted to show that on the name of the festival as well. Nowadays we change it because of like there was some some um, moves inside the organization, you know, and also like we decided to take the negative, you know, thing on the, um, in vibe on the name that its anti was giving to it, you know. Because I want to get into this with all of you, because the, the panel is about how different a music panels, and I, I, we haven't got anybody from SFX on the lineup. We have probably quite a few in the crowd, probably half of you are from SFX. Hey, who's from SFX? Uh, everyone else is just at least one. Um, Duncan Stutterheim, who's the kind of main, the main guy in Tomorrowlands and Sensations, and he's one of the key promoters in the SFX organization. Uh, he was talking about. Um, number of interesting quotes I'm going to quote from Duncan, talking six months ago about uh, William Morris' agency, about Richie Horton and uh, Joyce Vaughan joining uh, William Morris and charging 100 euro, 100,000 euros per show and kind of entering entering the kind of EDM DJ level, yeah. fee. So from your point of view, you're yeah. booking these people. Are you f yeah, like in Portugal, the, this completely different... Um, situation reality you know because it's a small country you know like um, there's no so much going on like in in, um, in what regards big fest electronic festivals especially these underground ones you know like you have boom festival which is like a, it's not only a music festival it's an arts festival you know and goes like for trans progressive you know like it's not they don't work, they don't sustain about the names they get, the artists they book, you know, like for example, Neopop is much more specialized on techno or house underground music, you know, and like for example, Richie or other artists are not charging what they charge in Spain or Italy or are Germany. You, are you finding it harder to book these people now that they're presumably being booked? Yeah, we have to explain our point of views, you know, like in our situation all the time. And sometimes you have to fight against some new promoters that just show up with the money, you know, and pay what they want, you know. But yeah, we are like, we are in the business for like 15 years. So like, it's not, I think like some of the guys, even the artists and the management also prefers to stay and work with some um, uh, trustable 
persons, you know, in, in Portugal, than, rather than go for a newcomer, you know, like with just the money, you know. Martin, I want to tap into some of your experience and your knowledge because you you were launching Creamfields in uh, 1991, very early in the, in the game of festivals. I mean, what what made you um, think that was the right time to do it then? I mean, what what was your mindset when you decided to first start the project? Well, we've been working with with electronic music in in the club world, you know, since years before the festival. So. And um, that was the time. We, we even put together the first Greenfield show in Argentina only two years after the first Greenfield in Liverpool. So we were the first country in the world that just pushed, that made a Greenfield show away from the UK. Uh, well, I believe that it was a, I'm not sure if, if I thought it was the right moment. I just want to do it. <laughs> so uh, it was, the first years were really rough and difficult because we need to, just to put a lot of people into for the, the expenses, but you know, I think it was something really good to do. The only festival that was running on that time was uh, Skull Festival here in Brazil. So we were the two first festivals in, in, in South America. So what made you decide, I mean, Skull Festival was a Brazilian uh, branded yeah. event, and what, what made you decide to work with a, with a UK festival instead of doing your own? Well, I always respect a lot, you know, UK music, you know, since I was a kid, you know, rock and roll, pop, and then electronic, and, and one, one of the main reasons was because I, I started a very good relationship with, you know, key people uh, that I respect since years in, in, the, in the business, and one of the, mostly, you know, James Barton and Scott Barton, you know, and Darren Hughes was a partner on that time as well. So, you know, we started doing cream uh, parties in clubs and then uh, the relationship, you know, just move forward and develop and, and, you know, I believe on what they were believing on that moment. So that's the reason why I decided to, and of course, you know, just going together with uh, um, an international brand was more <coughs> easy because, you know, just speaking about, well, I want to do a festival in Buenos Aires sounds like kind of really far away, so it was not as easy with agents and managers just to earn credibility. So it was a series of different reasons that uh, make our decision to start doing a, a you know, a already branded show. I mean, Nicole, for Sunburn Festival, you, you started Sunburn as an Indian branded event. One of the themes of the festival is made in India. There's a big focus on, you're, you're not working with SFX or <laughs> not the moment or Live Nation or any of, any of the other big global club brands. What, what was the rationale behind that with Sunburn? Why? Um, I think it's the, the owners of the parent company, Percept, are incredibly proud to be Indian and have been, um, for 30 years, they were doing live events in India, whether it was sporting events or charity events or just live events in general. India's largest uh, weddings and all, they used to ma uh, manage those as well. So it was actually fulfilling a need in the market at the time. Um, you know, with the, in the millennium, it was said that there were 600 million under the age of 25 in India. And if you considered, you know, they were, they were working in multinational corporations, they were um, under the social pressure still to get, you know, m married and working very hard. The only choices they had for entertainment at that time were um, the new shopping malls that were coming up cricket or Bollywood. Um, and all of those, you know, a movie theater, you just go sit in a dark movie theater, shopping malls, you know what that's like. So Percept actually launched two music festivals that year. One was um, a EDM experiment on the beach, they called it, in Goa, and the other was a metal fest. Um, so India had a, a background of, of metal music and rock music for some time. Um, the Metal Fest actually did, um, t you know, as far as ticket sales and attendance and all, it was actually, um, uh, did better than the, the um, Sunburn Festival. But the owners in that saw something in the music that it was mostly lyricless, it was all energy, and it was uniting people and giving them more of a space and a freedom. Um, than the Metal Fist, so they stuck with that. They dropped Metal Fist and they stuck with EDM. And they made a conscious effort from the beginning to, um, to grow it 
organically and internally. They did not go visit any other festivals in the world. To t they didn't want to be influenced that way. They wanted the festival to always be um, for the fans, of the fans, by the fans. So they just kept their attention on those fans and what they wanted to give them that. So yeah, we consider it, we're very proud to be a totally homegrown uh, Indian festival. I mean, Craig, I want to I go into the story of BPM and I look at your Wikipedia page, which is uh, full of really interesting uh, nuggets of information. And I, it took me by surprise that BPM, did BPM really stand for bartenders, promoters, and managers? Yeah, we, um, we were all sort of, uh, I mean, we were all from Canada, and it's pretty cold in January, and we're looking for an alternative for the industry to go to um, on a vacation. And, you know, BPM stands for bartenders, promoters, and musicians. And the high season in Canada, and uh, New York, Chicago, Detroit, is really up until New Year's Eve. And then after that, they have time off. Clubs really die off. So we felt that that was a good, um, a good time frame to do a festival. Or actually, at first it was called the BPM Conference, but uh, we had about three people show up for that one. So we decided to switch it to the festival. And uh, um, we've been doing it ever since. So what was the, what was the first year? So it was a conference similar to this kind of thing? or what, what uh, No, it? like I said, there's three people that showed up and uh, it really didn't work out. So uh, we just decided to uh, focus on a festival rather than uh, an actual conference portion. Because your, your festival is quite different in that you have lots of different venues and it's kind of taking over a whole geographical area. Yeah, we, um, we're a little bit different than all the other festivals. Um, we basically use the whole city as a, as a footprint and use the different venues that are already existing in the city. So we use um, some nightclubs at night, we use some beach clubs during the day, and you can buy a wristband and attend all the events depending on what particular stage or venue you're, uh, you're interested in. So I mean, now, now it's got all this buzz on it and it's established. Uh, was it instant success? Was it? No, the, the first year was, uh, I mean, luckily enough, we had all our friends come down and support and uh, we had some DJs come play for us that were basically our friends. And uh, it, was, it was a great year, it was fantastic. It definitely wasn't busy or profitable, but um, all the right people came and then the next year just grew and the next year grew, grew after that. To bring you into the conversation with your story, because yeah. you, were, you were a promoter, DJ, 21, you were doing all these underground parties in Portugal and everything else, and you still, you still run a club as yeah. well? Yeah, exactly. I mean, again, Neo popped the idea in the festival. What was the vision of that? Because you're doing it in a... Yeah, there was actually no... Okay, you have big festivals in Portugal, like more specializing bands, you know. Nowadays, they are turning into EDM festivals, actually. But um, and Neo Pop was like anti-pop on the time. Showed up like the only festival in Portugal, you know. Um, that was totally 100% underground and techno and house music, you know. And we decided to start it because there was nothing, you know. And this location is close to, to the north of Spain as well. And actually, we survived the first years <laughs> um, because of the Spanish people who was coming a lot, you know, because otherwise, if we we're leaving from the Portuguese crowd, we are, maybe the festival wouldn't exist anymore, for sure, it wouldn't exist anymore. But yes, the, the festival focused more like in the, in the specialized um, production for techno and house music, you know, like visuals. It's not only about music, it's more than that, like, uh, vid like videos, lights, everything is important. And the venue, of course, is al always important for, for the festival. You know? So Jose, bringing, bringing you in, Lollapalooza, again, I'm a, I'm a big avid reader of Wikipedia, and your Wikipedia page talks about uh, you started in 2011 with, with Perry Fowl. Is, yeah, so that's correct. You're co-producing it with we, Perry we, Fowl. We, we didn't have the lucky as uh, Argentina didn't came too much, so <laughs> financially the first year were really difficult. And um, So how did it work with Perry Fowl? How did you... Well, the first time we, um, we met twice with him and 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 uh, when they were like with the three c3 percent guy thinking about uh, going outside actually they didn't think about it too much but they were like looking on the good partners and then when we get on the play we were just making a, a start with you festival in chile which was called maquinaria that was the first year so 
uh, we find the correct time to present them how we produce a uh, big festival in Chile with this. Uh, before that, uh, there was not big festival around in, in Santiago. So <clears throat> after that, we were like, uh, we had like four months ahead for the festival and, and Brazil was also coming on the play, but Brazil wanted to wait for one year more and then we didn't, we, we were like, uh, Martin, we, we wanted to do it. So we were like, we got four months to book bands, to book the venue, to produce everything and luck and was a really four crazy month. Um, but we're really successful after that, you know, uh, we built something that was completely new in, in Santiago and then, then it started growing up after the third year there were you know increasing sales and attendance. So right now we're making the fifth year with like seventy thousand people per day. And there's uh dif different stages, different kind of music as um, um some of you if you don't know all about Little Palooza, uh, you got rock music, you got indie music, you got fall music uh, and then you got also electronic stage, which in Santiago we got this special park, Park O'Higgins, where it's like an arena. And the arena had got 18,000 people, which is like, on, it's completely covered. So you could start at 12 o'clock uh, uh, during the day to the electronic you know, music. So that's how it started, like, briefly. In I mean, the, ri the rise of, of EDM, Martin, I was looking at your Facebook, your Facebook page of Greenfields, and it's a picture of David Guetta with Martin Garrix making a track together. I mean, do you have to have an EDM these days to kind of bring in the numbers still? Is that? Well, it's a big festival, you know. <coughs> we, we make like 60,000 people approximately in the last years. And, and of course, you know, electronic music just grow, grew on the last years and you got public for everything. So being a big festival and representing, you know, a kind of representative about what's happening on the electronic music world, I think you should put whatever, you know, the people is requesting. And you got lots of kids that they are really fans of EDM now. Of course, we push forward a lot of underground music as well. Uh, so we try to make as balanced as possible and try to, well, sometimes it's really difficult that you go against with your personal tastes, but you know, um, it's, there's no way that you cannot just, you know, make happy the kids, you know. Craig, you're nodding your head. No, but my story is actually the opposite. We um, we were booking guys like Steve Angel in the beginning because we thought that's what people wanted. But um, actually, out of all the shows, the Richie Hottons, they were, you know, extremely busy, the Carl Coxes, and then we'd book Steve Angelo, and we had the room that was half full. <laughs> so for me, it was kind of like, I guess their crowd that was coming to BPM really didn't want EDM because they they worked in the industry and they were looking for something that they didn't hear on the radio or they didn't hear at the clubs. They're a little more into um, the underground sound, I guess. So is your your audience is predominantly more industry focused than? I mean, it it, it started off that way, and yeah. then I mean, obviously, things sort of spread from there. But originally, it was that was the crowd that was coming from New York and Toronto, Chicago, and then uh, I guess their friends started coming and their friends' friends started coming and just sort of grew from there. How are you, how are you kind of reaching? You're creating these events with tens and thousands of people. I mean, Nicole, you've got 500 million Indians who like cricket and going shopping and watching films. How did you manage to get those kids interested to come all the way to Goa, which is quite a long way away from all the big cities? I think it was the EDM DJs. As the EDM DJs rose in the charts and became more like pop stars, the Indians um, could access that easily on you know the billboard lists and all that. Um, but more than that, and we're not only EDM, we do have at the Sunburn Goa Festival, we do also have seven stages. Um, we do have a dedicated side trance stage and a techno stage and an experimental stage. So we do have that, but you know, the main stage is still always our, our biggest stage, and anyone who doesn't want the EDM DJs will definitely take them because the youth just can't get enough of those DJs. They just every year want the same ones back and back and back. Um, but I think what worked for us is that we tapped into the story of, of, of what the youth were looking for, and they were looking for an escape. Um, you know, again, working hard, studying hard, 
always on the phone, always on the computer. I think they realized every you know humans are social creatures. They wanted to unplug. They wanted a reason to unplug. Most of our venues are out outdoors. That's in our sunburn DNA to be outside under the sun and under the stars. So I think they really appreciated that um, um, excuse to come outside and play. And um, they, the bigger the DJs got, the bigger our crowds got as well. But sunburn itself became a movement of unity. Again, the energy of, of uh, electronic music is unlike even the pop stars coming or the rock bands coming where you kind of have to understand their lyrics, you have to know their backstory, you have to know what that song is about if you want to, to enjoy it. In, uh, in electronic music, you don't have that. In you know, India with 29 states and hundreds of different languages and cuisines could all unify um, around electronic music. So I think that energy and that movement really took hold in India and eight years later, I mean, going, still going strong. I mean, do, you, do you, any of you worry about this? this another quote from Duncan Stutterheim again, the SFX uh, uh, Tomorrowland's main promoter, uh, saying that uh, EDM DJs and their agents are ruining the festival experience because they're, they're charging such high fees that they have to cut back on production and sound and lights. I mean, Martin, is that something you're coming up against increasingly, or is it you just don't book people if they get too expensive? Or? <laughs> That's a rough subject to, to speak about, about fees and, you know, it's business, you know, it's, it's like every business. Uh, it's, you know, offer and demand, so you got DJs that are charging a lot of money and it depends on, you know, what you're going to be achieving about that DJ. So it's take it or leave it, that's the way business is. You're not fussed about this trend. So Sorry? You don't see this trend becoming a problem? Uh, well, you know, uh, it is a problem, of course. It depends on your numbers. Uh, but that's what I'm saying. If you pay $500,000 for a DJ that is selling 25,000 tickets, then <laughs> you need to take your calculator and see what, what's the best thing. Anyway, that's business, and that has nothing to do with, you know, with the soul of the heart of the... Of, but I think there are certain festivals for certain objectives and other ones for others. You had Creamfields, Argentina, as my example, you know, of the things that I do, which is a mainstream show, and then we have Time World, which is totally underground. So, uh, of course, if Richie Hotty in the day of tomorrow charges three hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> maybe Time World is gonna <laughs> get out of time. But you know, it's, uh, it's, it's business. How do, how do you protect the soul of your event when you've got you're booking artists that maybe you're not personally liking and? Maybe you're booking more and more. How, how do you protect the essence of it? What, what is the essence of it? Well, I've been a fan of electronic music since it, it began, and I'm, now I am also a promoter, so I need to just listen to the music that I like in my home and then go to the festival and work. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I still try to push events with, with, with music that maybe I believe a little bit more, and. And I think that they're at the base of electronic music and the way that it will stand for years, uh, which, of course, is, is more the kind of quality underground music. I mean, talking about, uh, I mentioned in BPM about your, your structure of lots of different venues. You're very successful. There must be other promoters looking at wanting to come in and copy you or ride on the back of you. How, how do you uh, manage this whole keeping all the venues on stream, avoiding? I mean, that's definitely in little bit of an issue for us um, obviously we try to work with the biggest and best venues in Playa some in Tulum um, but really it's just it's it's managing a relationship and you have to manage different relationships in different venues and we try to give them the best product that we can give them and most people understand that working with us they're gonna get a better DJ or sell more tickets in their venue than they would working with someone else because um, we work with pretty much everyone we try to at least that we uh, that we believe in. So that's been really the toughest part because we're trying to plan in advance. And um, in Mexico particularly, it's very hard to get a hold of a club owner in the summertime because he's running around, he's on vacation, et cetera. So um, that's been one of the biggest hurdles for us is figuring out how to work with these venues and stick, uh, then stick with us. Okay, I popped into um, the night mayor of Amsterdam. Uh, Should we in the crowd? There's a guy here from Amsterdam who's, who's the, he's the nightmare of Amsterdam. And he's a lovely, lovely guy. If you, if you get a chance to talk to him, he's a super interesting guy. And he's, um, he's handling all the issues in Amsterdam 
about drugs, about uh, health issues. And so in, in Europe at the moment, uh, there's been a bad batch of ecstasy pills that are not ecstasy, they're, they're PMA. And in Holland, they put out all these warnings and nobody took them, they were all destroyed. But in England, the government ignored, they didn't put out a warning and there were like four or five ecstasy deaths. And again, the clubs seem to get the blame, even though in Holland where they're announcing it. I mean, for you guys, um, it always seems you're in the firing line on this more often than not. How, how do you, um, I, mean, I know AFEM are doing a talk about this tomorrow as well. I mean, how do you see this trend going? Is this something that you feel you have to avoid to avoid being dragged into it? Or, I mean, Jose, how's it? I, I just, just remember an example that, um, for example, in Sonar Barcelona, which um, well, we make a partnership, I'm doing Sonar on Santiago on December 5th. And there's a tent uh, on Sonar Night where you could uh, taste the drugs uh, people could give you. Test. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Test. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's another, that was another term. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so so the, thing, the thing is that it's freaky that you could do it in a festival where like, yeah, this, yeah. The, this promoters know that the, the people sell drugs on the festival and they I mean, they can't avoid that, and so the only thing they could do that is like, you know, warning people like what they are taking on their own festival, which I think is like, I mean, pretty interesting stuff. Some others make some campaigns, yeah, yeah. and I think, I, think, I think it's important. Like the information is everything, you know. You know, drugs will be all the time in the festivals, especially in the electronic music festivals. But like in Portugal, for example, there's an association that they. They work with the government, they get some money from the government, and they go, like, I have all the years, I have them in my festival, and they give, they do the tests, not <laughs> the tastings, <laughs> they do the tests on drugs as well, and I'm like, and I think that's, um, you, you are concerned about your crowd, you're concerned about what they're taking, you know, and that's already good, because, like, okay, like, in the end, you're, like, uh, you don't, don't, don't care about your crowd. It's it's really bad, you know. If you at least you inform, and um, and people can see what they're taking or not, you know. In the end, it's uh, it's positive for everyone. I think. At Sunburn, we're really watching that everything that's going on in the nightmare and uh, the the testing and all. And we really respect that. But in India, we we can't admit that those things actually happen at festivals yet. Um, we're still in the completely um, prevention stage. We have, you know, the, the organizers of the festival get a lot of phone calls from politicians or uh, commissioners or something that say, my kids want to go to your festival. You'll take care of them while they're there. And with the family, yeah, it's, everyone is someone's kid. So, um, but we do everything we can preventatively. So as an organization, um, we, we actively approach the, the Narcotics Commission of India and they said put, you know, 20 CCTV cameras, we put 40. They said have 10 dogs, we put 10 dogs, uh, 20 dogs. So um, we really, we do our best with big uh, say, no, say no to drugs, say yes to life campaigns. Um, um, but we really respect what a lot of organizations in the world are doing as far as the... We know. also have police, like, of course, on the entrance, but, like, we don't have dogs at all, you know, like, they are really light, you know, and, and they try to educate and talk with the people as well, you know. Yeah. Sometimes they even find something, but you go into the festival and they, 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 they let people go, you know. It's, in Portugal, it's still like, like that, because there's not been any problem, like, in the 10 years, you know, if it starts to get to have pro to have like to exist a lot of problems in the festivals of course they're gonna be stricter and harder, you know, like and they're gonna do some to change the policy for sure, you know. But Port Portugal's decriminalized drugs for like fifteen fifteen years? Um, yeah. 2000? I think so, yeah, but only uh, like um, mainly the um, the cannabis, okay. you know, and ashish. Like nowadays like you can you you can be caught like with some grams, <laughs> like depends on the drug, of course. But like you go to a psychologist, you know, like, and um, there's there's still there's some uh, some um, opening minds about it, but it's been changing, you know. Like it's kind of legal, but if you get caught, it's not it's not so funny as well. I guess Craig, you must be in an awkward position with the America 
still driving the war on drugs in Mexico yeah. and the drug war going on. I mean, um, is that a problem for you guys? Or, I mean, I guess you have to. It's, it's definitely a problem because you're working in a country that's um, not as well policed as America. And, you know, it's, a, it's been a very touchy subject for us. We're trying to do our best to um, navigate through both sides of the uh, of the fence, and uh, we're still working towards it. We've been working with the local authorities and the mayor and the governor, trying to figure out how to um, solve the issue. But uh, the government is still trying to figure it out, so we're trying to help them in some sort of way. But it's, uh, it's been a very tough, tough uh, road. I mean, Martin, have you, have you benefited from the Uruguay legalization? I mean, is that is that trickled over to Argentina or? Uh, no, no. Uh, we basically, uh, Argentina, you know, kind of work regarding, you know, just prevention and that kind of thing is really weak. You know, it's nothing that, that you can relay uh, <coughs> about the, the, the crowd being informed. So we try to work together with the local authorities. Uh, it's, you know, Argentina, uh, in a big festival at Screenfest, you got part of the crowd which is really hardcore with drugs. That's, that's the problem. They go really, really bad. And we even got some some guys that, that not in our festival but in other electronic music shows that passed away. Uh, so you know it's kind of a big issue and a problem for us as promoters. Uh, so the, what we try to do is to work together with the local authorities, being you know from from the government and even private institutions, providing information. You know, which is free water you know, assistance, psychological assistance, you know, whatever we can do. And we are always keen to help in, in just kids to, to learn to take more care. So that's, that's all what we can do. I was reading a story, just changing the subject a little bit away from that, about uh, social issues. Uh, Brazil is having this terrible drought at the moment. Sorry. Um, I understand it's like a biblical drought almost. And uh, in fact, one of my friends, Camilo Rocha, posted a piece who's a Brazilian journalist about uh, Tomorrowlands is happening in one of the cities where the drought's been particularly bad. And uh, he was raising the question of um, the festival using a lot of water. And the, the, the attendance figures for Tomorrowland were bigger than the population of this town that's got rationing and everything else. And for you guys, um, do you think it's important you do start to educate, use, social, use your platforms, use your audiences for social awareness issues, whether it's um, global warming or anything like this? Is this, is this relevant for you guys at all? Or, I mean, Martin again with, with uh, Greenfields, do these elements come in for you or the what, sorry? social issues, whether it's uh, global warming, I'm using the water as an example? Well, or Yeah, we, we are always keen, you know, just to, you know, whatever we can use uh, our, you know, communication network regarding things that can help to the audience. and and make things better, of course, we are always, you know, just ready to work in team, whom, whomever would be credible, yeah. ED Lollapalooza, just switching tactic again, I'm, I'm curious about the EDM bubble, there's a lot of talk about it. Do, do you book EDM DJs in your electronic? Yeah, we, we, we book EDM as well, but uh, we get a little bit different uh, from Lollapalooza Chicago, where the, on our stage we try to book also underground music. So, or at least like some music that not always will be EDM. So we get the chance to book like uh, national DJs or Latin DJs, Adam Hart or Chet Fugger or some other DJs that you could think that not fit on what, you know, Paris stage it's looked like usually. Um, but it's still like really, we get two days, uh, it's like eight DJs per day. So. Right now, for example, next year is curious. We get Skrillex and, and Calvin Harris playing for first time on the main stage, which is like they they become so big that they can't play on the arena. Uh, the same the same thing that happened when we booked Dead Mouse Five, and and Dead Mouse was the same the same thing. And right now we got like two main stage uh, with two you know headline DJs, and I, I think that becomes what it's going on with electronic music. It's becoming so big that you have to fit it on what the audience, you know, will um, look for it. Um, but then we don't book too much uh, EDM on, on, on the large of the, of the year. Uh, I think this, we, we get a lot, there's another producer also that is very well known, work a lot of SFEX. 
with electronic music. They do Mistrela, they do Creamfield as well. And uh, we were like into it also in trying to book also like more underground music. That's the reason why we're doing Sonar and trying to put some other kind of music as well in Chile, which is like still uh, not so developed as Argentina and also Brazil. So you you all yeah. you all independent promoters. Um, last year seen SFX c creating this huge organization, Live Nation, uh, <laughs> in a positive way. I mean, how much how much is the emergence of these? Conglomerates change the game for you guys. Is it, is it, is it having a much of an impact? I mean, is it affecting you at all in Portugal? Portugal, for really? now, I, I, that I know. For now, <laughs> they're still not in in the business. I don't know. But yeah, for for example, for example, like my festival is has been like um, always um, from our investment. Portugal does like the underground music in Portugal is not so keen to get sponsorized, you know, yeah. like big sponsors. So like it's, we take our own risk on doing the festival and we go for it, you know, it's like our passion, you know, and it's kind of our mission, you know, to, to make it work. And we've been dealing with it since till now. It's, it's okay. You know, I don't, I don't know, like SFX, maybe they can come in Portugal by they should come with a bigger festival for sure, like in a more mainstream vision, you know, like that show includes maybe some underground DJs that I book and I work with, and that's maybe mess with my, my business, okay, but let's see how it goes. <laughs> what, about, what about India, Nicole? Are you getting, are you getting a competition there yet? Or? Competition? Um, not really. We're, we own and, f and fund 95% of the market there. So um, anyone that is trying to be competition is just someone that has, has, has left our organization and now doing their own thing. Um, but we are very um, focused on what we're doing. We have our blinders on. So as of now, it's not really troubling us. So we're just going ahead with our plans. We are also um, trying to educate the, the market a lot. Uh, what happened was we, we started with just the one main festival at the end of the year and then we realized that there was so much more potential and the education aspect so we now have a top down and bottom up strategy we do like you said 200 events in the year so we do our go uh, city festivals in four different cities we do tier two cities where we go to smaller clubs or established clubs there and we do sunburn nights we do arena gigs which are artist led just the afro jacks and the axwells um, and we do campus gigs. So we take our mini arenas and we take them to the campuses um, and inculcate the youth. They're free, there's no alcohol, but anywhere 4,000 to 10,000 kids are there going mad for these DJs. So, I mean, 200 events in a year, you can't really compete with that. <laughs> where, do, where do you all stand on the kind of, you mentioned uh, sponsorship, and we talked about this on, on the email. I mean, Craig, is it, is it part of your model? Do you need brands to...? I mean, we definitely like to have it, but um, you know, it just increases the, the value of the event. You can add more production, you can get better DJs, you can do things with having a sponsor, but um, it's not really... We don't really get a lot of sponsorship. It's never been our focus, but we'll take the money and reinvest it back in the festival. So you're not opposed to it in principle? You're opposed to it in principle, right? Sorry? You're opposed to sponsorship in, in principle, or...? Yeah, no, like we are like we of course we have small small partnerships, you know, and small sm sponsors. But like like Craig says, we're not focused on that. Like we focus on doing our job and setting up the festival and trying to to make it better every year that passes. You know, like that's that's our thing. You know, like if the sponsor comes to us, let's see. But we're not uh, we don't defend like in this event, this kind of event, we're not. Uh, Get, no, not so keen and so you don't see with good eyes like the branding name, you know, like or giving the the naming for the festival to a brand, you know, at all. It always seems to me, maybe I'm wrong. I always think with promoters, I would never dare be a promoter because it seems to me that you would know you, what, I would never dare be a promoter because I, I'd be worried that no one would come to the party, and B, I'd be thinking that it's just always a huge gamble that you end up spending an enormous amount of money and no one comes to the party. I mean. Are you all basically 
fair to say you're all gamblers, or are you just ultra cautious, or you you know secrets that we? <laughs> I'd like to else? say educated gamblers. Educated yeah, gamblers. Because you know we kind of know our business, and we know kind of what works for us so we take a gamble on that but sometimes you can't control the weather you can't control certain scenarios government sometimes don't agree with you on certain things so we're doing our best to take a gamble but what's been, what's been the biggest hopefully. disaster you've had what's been the worst thing that's come millennium <laughs> millennium 2000 was the worst experience i've ever had we were expecting it to be the biggest event and uh, ended up being the biggest loss we've ever had okay for all of you martin what's been your biggest disaster well, uh, Mine was a 2009 Creamfield show, Argentina, that the government canceled the show six days before the date. And we need to just reschedule the show and do it, you know, 35 days later. So I lost almost all the lineup, you know, all the investment of marketing, whatever you can imagine when a show is canceled just six days before. Give back, you know, all the money from the tickets and, you know, it was, it was a $1 million disaster. I was actually there for that. Uh, <laughs> pulled it off, though. Yeah. <laughs> Jose, your biggest disaster. No. You must have had a few. The drug tasting tent. No, no. <laughs> no. What's no. that? <laughs> I, actually, I, I, we, we haven't had like really big one, as as, um, as mentioned, uh, Martin, and um, like, uh, I mean. The first year we did Lollapalooza, we got four months to do to do everything, and uh, we just announced it without uh, the government agree on that we are good doing Lollapalooza. So it was like one month before the con the, the the council want to cancel the whole festival. So, but finally we we agreed to to make it happen. So actually. We get some accidents and incidents on, on the festival, which I don't want to extend right now. So, but I, we've been lucky, so we we haven't been too much, uh, and, you know, having like big disaster on our festival. Hopefully, Nicole Sunburn, you've had a few, haven't you? I we've know. we've had two major. Um, our second year in 2008, the Mumbai terror attacks happened, 2611, which was one month before our festival. Um, so this, the city of Mumbai and all of India was still reeling. Um, and it was generally, all events were canceled all across the country. Nothing happened in India um, until after the New Year. All New Year's functions were were canceled and it was assumed that we would not um, have our festival, but the owners of the festival actually stood up, gathered the media and said, you know what, we want to keep this festival on. We want to unite um, all of our fans there. We want to give respect and we want to celebrate the moment that we do all still have now. Um, and we were the only event that happened in the whole country for the rest of the year. And it turned out to be, um, you know, a good release and again, bonding for people um, to, to get together and, and, and uh, remember that. And then the Swedish House Mafia tour, which was three years ago, was very, very, very difficult for us. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. Um, the very first opening night, it was the biggest event, biggest live event that India had had. So we were all geared up for that. We opened the gates, 4,000 kids ran into the venue and we got a phone call that um, a massive politician in the city had just passed away. So um, we had to cancel the gig um, in respect for the family again. All events that day and for the week had to be canceled. So we canceled, they did the Delhi gig, we brought them back in a few months um, and we added another city, we did Mumbai and Bangalore. On the way from, I think Bali, they were in Bali, the massive storm was there, a ladder truck hit their private jet, they couldn't fly, they couldn't take off, again we had to cancel, the event had to be on a Monday. Um, they came and so many, there was 20,000 cars parked in the streets around the city. So traffic was at a dead stop. They reached late, but they couldn't get to the venue. <laughs> we, had, we had motorcycles, but the insurance wouldn't allow, and we let them in the back gates. And then again, when something plain trouble the next day, getting them to the next event, it was just very, very difficult and very, very stressful. But at the end of the day, the fans got what they wanted. Um, you know, the guys had a great show, and it ended up being a massive, a massive event for India. But it was for us, it was crazy. So okay, I think we're almost out of time. Any questions from the crowd? Can you sh take my microphone? <laughs> um, do you guys, in your festivals, do you open up space for? Um, new acts, people are coming up to have like special tents, 
like I've, I've played in many festivals where they had like a uh, space for new artists, up and coming artists, DJs, whatever. And if you do, what's the best way to reach you guys to send material and all that stuff? Well, um, actually, this year, this year we started a new stage, um, really for that kind of, of acts. You know, like not only local acts, but to support also the local artists. But also, it's like 1,000 person stage, but with the same sound system, with the same conditions, you know. I don't like to, to call it like a secondary stage because it's not, you know. It's just a new stage, a smaller stage, but yes. Like, um, that we, we're gonna push some new names on the scene that don't have the chance to play the bigger stage, you know. And yes, I can give you my card, and then <laughs> you keep in, we keep in touch. Yeah, same, same with us. We have seven stages, so we have a lot of space for, for new acts. But our college, our campus gigs are where we really um, focus emerging talent from around the world. Because again, for that artist, it's an instant 4,000, 10,000 kids. Um, and and uh, for, for the artist, uh, and for the kids, they get to experience um, the new acts. And also, again, same, give me your card. I'll take it back to India and give it to my team. Uh, we don't usually just book, you know, for like Greenfield shows, like many, many like young talent. Uh, we do, of course, always take a look about people that is, uh, you know, just more newer and fresh. And, 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 and in the case that we, we found that as a possibility, we, we, we consider that. But mainly what we do is we do a lot of club stuff during the year, you know, like hundreds of gigs. And that's mainly where we, we test, you know, the new not, not the test is not the right word, but we give the opportunity to, to new people to, to warm ups or whatever, you know, is better, well, more compatible regarding their, their style. And that's the, the best way just to open doors to the, to the new people. Yeah, from, from the 60 artists that we bring, like at least 20 haven't come to South America before. So the difficult situation for Chile, for example, is that we got to uh, put together uh, uh, like the artists with Argentina, with Bogota and Brazil, which sometimes, you know, uh, our interest from some artists, we need to, you know, deal with other promoters and then make, you know, um, a consensus. So we've been like uh, put in two different stages for specifically locally artists because it's like low budget, but there's kind of uh, trying to uh, remain what, uh, uh, for example, um, uh, UK festivals, uh, Glastonbury, others, actually, you know, get like different stages, little ones that you never knew that they were existing, then you could, but it's the same thing that would be in touch, and then there's always willing to uh, hear some new stuff and new music. So Craig, I've heard you're booking like a year ahead. <laughs> well, um, for us, we, we usually work with record labels, so we found this is a great incubator system to find out who the next big up-and-coming talent's going to be because the labels are the one putting out the music. So every year we get some new acts that haven't played at BPM because they're the new hot act on the labels. So um, that's pretty much how we've built our whole incubator system. Okay, so it makes sense. Sound a good label, then you get to BPM. Worked for us really well. It's also been great for the crowd because now they know who's coming up yeah. and uh, who they're excited to see. It's interesting. Okay. Any one more question? Jump over that. Um, I just like to know, like in Australia, we've seen a new trend where big festivals like the Big Day Out, which featured like lots of different genres and rock music and electronic music, they seem to struggle a lot. And festivals like Future, which only focus on electronic music, they seem to be doing well. Is there like a certain trend in South America where the bigger festivals are covering lots of different genres? are doing better or, or smaller festivals only focusing on like underground house or EDM doing, uh, starting to do better? Uh, I think that, you know, there are several festivals that, you know, are very good. I, I, I believe that, you know, a, a festival which is very well planned regarding lineup and mix certain styles is, is also a, a great idea and also just, you know, delivers new content for the market. I don't think it's gonna, I, th I don't think, at, at least for the moment, not a trend. I think that you got shows that are more specialized in certain styles, and other ones that are more mixed. 
you know, you got the Glastonbury in England, which is a massive, you know, successful, you know, 40 years old festival, which makes a lot of things, and they remain, you know, on the top of, of the best five festivals of the world. Yeah, yeah. We're out of time, guys. So thank you, thank you all very, very much for the great panel. Thank you. Thank you.